Hello, let's just wait for Rupert. Got some nice little there we go. funky music. Hello, Rupert. Uh, hi, Matthew. How are you? Thanks All right, for inviting good. me. There we go. No, thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Let's see if we can just sort this music out here a little bit. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine with a little bit of tinkly music in the background. Yeah, fine. Just um, thought I'd improve a little bit on the podcast skills there. <laughs> a little bit of music for people as we wait for everybody to connect and get the audio levels right. So if you can hear me and I can hear you and everybody can hear the funky music, then let's begin. We can put some more funky music in the middle later on. So welcome back, Rupert Coke. Um, I, it was a pleasure to speak to you last time. I think it was in September, wasn't it? We spoke last time about how things were going and things have changed muchly since then. Uh, indeed, it was. I really enjoyed our last conversation. I'm sure this one will be good. Uh, thanks for having me. And yeah, things are slowly changing in Spain. I think this is going to be quite an interesting election to watch. Yeah, let's talk about the elections in, in Castilla y León. Why, why? The first question I think I was saying before is, why, why should a listener in Washington or London or Moscow uh, pay attention to the regional elections in Castilla y León in Spain? It's a great question. And I think that this these elections are a test case to see to what extent the PP is recovering. The PP is obviously the conservative, the centre-right party. It's traditionally uh, quite business-friendly, uh, social conservative, Christian Democrat, uh, with uh, uh, some liberals take part in it as well, liberals in the European sense, not necessarily the American sense. And uh, they, and, uh, they have uh, struggled with corruption issues. Uh, so it's just quite interesting to see how well they do. I think that's going to be the main uh, the main takeaway when the elections come on the 13th. You know, one thing that surprised me the other night, looking at, or over the weekend, looking at all of this a little bit and, and sort of reading around references, I always like to look at maps to see who's got the best one and the, the biggest one. And, um, and, and Castilla León is actually bigger than Ireland. The whole, the, both the country, the Republic of Ireland and the whole island of Ireland, which I didn't know. So that's quite that's a huge area. Wow for people to be paying attention yeah. to and obviously the population is, is smaller but I, I was I was quite surprised by that I didn't know it was quite so I, I looked it up this afternoon when I was preparing this call and was surprised to see that it's the largest autonomous community in in Spain I would have assumed that Andalusia was bigger right I, we were revised in fact I was revising this with my son this weekend because he's in he's in the fourth year of primary school at the minute and his subject for this weekend his exam for this week was the basic organization of Spain with its regions. And we were looking at this, and uh, I, it, it's true. Spain, uh, Castilla has got nine provinces, Andalusia has got eight. So it's the biggest region of Spain um, in, in, in administrative terms, and it's bigger than Ireland. Going back to what you were saying about the battle for the right and the, and the test for Casado, I was wondering that too. I mean, I've been focusing a lot on the Vox aspect of it and the Vox propaganda, as I see it, over the last couple of weeks i think it's just very blatant at this point but in terms of their propaganda skills their political communication skills i think they're doing they're, they're from a political propaganda point of view from a campaigning point of view they've got they seem to have a better communication team than the pp at this point so i wonder if at some point in the future we're going to start to see vox moving past the pp in some regions, first of all, perhaps not winning outright, but at least moving past. Gasset. It's a great question. And I agree with you on the observation. I agree. I disagree with Vox fairly profoundly on most issues, but they've managed to get everyone talking about their, you know, what could be a fairly boring campaign. Uh, they've, they've really managed to kind of hack the attention of journalists. Uh, I the thing that. I have a lot of, I married into a Spanish family. I have a lot of uh, family in, in Castilla y León, you know, and I think, so, so I know the area quite well. Not all of it, as it's quite a big area. I think one of the, one of the issues is that it's very small C conservative, uh, not necessarily reactionary, but people aren't, the ordinary people aren't generally tremendously interested in politics. Uh, it's the, 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 it doesn't you mean, have you mean Spain, Spain, is a, Spain is a country? In, or, in, or in, in, in the Castillas, in my, in my experience, you know, people will talk about the politicians they dislike, but it's never the, the main topic of conversation or whatever. Uh, so I think that it's somewhere where Vox has 
obviously trying very hard to target its message at rural voters. But I'm not sure that they have a very good idea on who rural voters are or what they really want. If you look at the famous photo opportunity they did, I think a week or two ago, where they all appeared almost in fancy dress. Let's dress up as, as country people, you know. And, and one of them famously had a hawk on her arm. You know, it was amazing. I think they've gone. Too, I think they've gone too far with that. It's just so it was, obvious. So, so it was know. silly. It was silly because what, 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 what's that? What, what they've done is, if you look at their jobs and you put them in Wikipedia and you see, it's a lawyer, it's a career politician, it's another lawyer, it's an architect. You know, they're city people. They're probably hard. To, they're probably hard the to top stylists to to. To, to find the hawk and buy the clothes of fashion photographers. And I don't, I, you know, I, I, I haven't visited Castilla Leon recently, so I haven't been able to check this, but my, my, my gut feeling is that this is something that's not going to really resonate with people in small villages. It's what a city person thinks will resonate. Right. Did you, did you catch the debate the other night? Uh, I saw a little bit of it. I didn't watch very, I didn't watch the whole thing. Did it give you the impression of being firstly very interesting and secondly that anybody was winning particularly? <laughs> no, it seems very. Uh, for, as I say, I didn't watch the whole debate, so I'm probably not the best person to to comment on it. But it seemed very mundane, and I think most people have got a fairly clear idea of who they who they're going to vote for. But coming back to the, I mean, I think you made an interesting point about whether Vox can overtake the PP. Uh, Vox being populist, right, Trumpist. Uh, I would say far right, but every time you call them far right on Twitter, it annoys their supporters a lot and they get very annoying and start sending lots of tweets about how they're not on the far right. Uh, although they've just held a big, uh, a, a big photo opportunity with, uh, with Le Pen and Orban. So I feel that uh, <laughs> those arguments are on, are on thin ice. I, I feel that Fox is trying to appeal to two different audiences simultaneously. It's trying to kind of appeal to uh, anti-vaxxers, people who are very angry at the political establishment, people who want a big change, protest votes. And at the same time, they don't really want to nail their colours to their masks. They try and do it with a little bit of ambiguity and try and keep those messages do, in, do you think in, in war. Do you think that Vox is doing the same thing with the... With with its far right connotations, because how can I? I don't know. I mean, how can you not be? How, how can you even if you try to defend the position at the minute that Vox is not far right itself, like we used to understand this word in the old days? Um, once you start associating with Marine Le Pen and people like that, how can you can't you can't reject the label of far right for for what they're trying to do? At least that kind of thing. Do you think the same thing is happening with the far right label or connotation? as has been happening over the past few months, since we last spoke, in fact. I think it was just about then that Abbas Gal went on the radio and refused to say whether or not he'd been vaccinated. And since then, they seem to have been sort of toying with the anti-vaxxers. Exactly. And I think there's an interesting point. We, when we say far right, we kind of mean one thing. But I think the far right there were actually probably two far rights. You know, as someone who grew up in the UK in the, you know, as a teenager in the 1980s, and for me, the far right implies football hooligans and the National Front and the British National Party and, you know, these thuggish idiots going and beating people up. But you, there's also another far right, which is more the kind of Nigel Farage far right, the Donald Trump far right, right, right wow. up to the Capitol riots, you know, the, 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 the Marine Le Pen far right, well, have fathers in the other one which is a it's still far right but they put on my nice suits and they don't shave their heads and they uh they they, they, they don't go out and beat up in immigrants <laughs> uh you know although they that some of the rhetoric remains this remains very similar and i think we see something similar on the on the far left you know there's a there's obviously a difference between someone who is a communist revolutionary and someone who's kind of communist like uh, carmena was in 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 madrid where yeah it was almost like she was a catholic and that was her religion but it didn't really worry her on too much on a day-to-day -day basis you know Right, a kind of a new, a new, me, a new um, definition of far right and far left that's not as extreme as it used to be, but it's still beyond what conservative and socialist have meant for the past few exactly. years. Uh, some, some sort of more radical. Actually, in fact, looking over it, looking at it over the weekend, I came across a book uh, called the Oxford Handbook of the Radical Right, which seems to be an academic tone on tome on um, 
on, on this very subject across Europe with several learned uh, professors from different European universities writing about this very subject and the definitions and things. And they, uh, it's, it's 100 euros on Amazon, even the Kindle version, so we'll have to wait a little bit for that. But the, um, the, the, the idea is that that's the idea, and they've gone for radical right. So it's just sort of an attempt to, in the same way that, that the, the right labelled Podemos as the new far left a few years ago when they appeared, I think it's not. We, we need to have that debate, don't we, about whether they, what the what the right label is, perhaps, or whether or not the radical right, far right, extreme right is probably not I, right. I, I, think, I, I agree, and I think that the radical right, far right uh, distinction kind of get points in the same direction. I like populist right, and I also like populist left for for Podemos. Populism yeah. being, I think, liberal democracy being a system that's based on just getting rid of the government. Power corrupts, so we need a system to get rid of the government, so we need elections, and we need free and fair elections, and uh, and they need to be rule-based, which the Catalan nationalists don't like, uh, and, and then you have a system for a peaceful transition of power. And the, the people are just anyone who happens to have the right to vote in that election, plus other people who happen to live in, in the country. Uh, what, Right, and then we get to then we then we could get on to Catalan separatist yeah. nationalist populists as well, and Trump and Brexit and all the rest. But the the um, what was I going to say? So the national populist that also gives them both on the left and the right. Podemos did it a few years ago. Now Vox is doing it again with this discourse and narrative. This is against the elite, exactly. So we, against those who are in established power. Pablo Iglesias used to call them the Castellini, yeah. this the establishment, and then he became part of the establishment of the obviously himself, and that's what Vox wants as well, but they're doing it with a narrative which is heavy on globalist elites and the bureaucrats in yeah. Brussels, which is a bit like Brexit and Farage in Britain, um, but it's also a bit sort of conspiracy theory nonsense like the anti-vaxxer stuff. Exactly, well. and I think there's a really good book that I recommend to everyone called uh, What is Popul Populism by an academic called Muller. Very short, cheap book on the Kindle, well worth reading, you can read it in an afternoon. And he says that the definition, he, says, he describes populism as a thin ideology, and he says it can have left-wing or right-wing manifestations, uh, but the basic idea is the populists think that elections aren't about the peaceful transition of power, Elections are to find out what is the will of the people, which in political theory, there people don't have a will. <laughs> you know, uh, 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 will belongs to individuals, not to collectives. Okay, and then populists say, "I represent the will of the people," and obviously there are people who vote against you and the opposition, and so you go, "Well, those people aren't the real people." You know, they're a which a exactly what the Catalan separatists argue years right up to the supreme court when they were on trial exactly and i think the the, the the what you said what we see in spain what makes spain unusual is we have three populist movements who hate each other you know you have the uh, podemos on the left who are the populist left you have the catalan nationalists who find some common ground with podemos sometimes and then fox which emerged to fight podemos and the catalan nationalists is also populist. You read, you sit down and read uh, Vox's uh, manifesto, and it's amazing. It has things like, we are going to take away the passport of naturalized, uh, naturalized uh, Spaniards, Spanish, naturalized immigrants to Spain who are against the, the, the national sovereignty. <laughs> wow, you know, it's obviously just aimed at someone like Echenique, who's a, who's a, Podemos, uh, Podemos politician who uh, uh, immigrated from Argentina, but you know, they, normally in liberal democracy, the people choose the choose the politicians. But in populism, the politicians want to try and choose the people. And I, somebody on Twitter, on I can't remember the name of the reader, sorry, at the at the minute, but somebody the other day on Twitter talking about this over the weekend mentioned this aspect of ethno nationalism and said, "Do you, do do, you, do I do I really think that the that Vox is is articulating or, or uh, drawing up or, or presenting a, a political philosophy which is sort of exclusive towards other races or other um, ethnic groups and, and reading what they write in their manifestos and things and listening to the speeches, to me it seems clear and it, it doesn't, it goes beyond that because it seems to be a sort of discourse as well, uh, a narrative, a political proposition which is which is 
different to what we've seen in modern democracies over the past few decades, even, in some aspects. Yeah, I, I fully agree. And I think we saw exactly the same thing in Catalonia in a very unfiltered way. <laughs> you know, they, were, they, they, they clearly just, anyone who disagreed with them was a colonist or a fascist and uh, not authentically Catalan. But I think Vox do the same thing. And, you know, some of the uh, some of the campaigns they've done against Menas, non-Spanish speakers, that, that those are uh, we'll need to know that those are kind of teenage immigrants from countries like Morocco, who, because they come to Spain, arrive in Spain without their parents or guardians, they have to be adopted by the state. And Vox does all these very conspiratorial campaigns about them. And obviously, uh, right. there's, there's a clear other group. There's a clear other group in in their political rhetoric, isn't it? It's always the same group, and they welcome the Latin American immigrants. And when they talk about they, they say that, OK, it's against illegal immigrants, not just immigrants generally. But then when they develop their rhetoric and do their speeches and put out their ads and tweets and things, it always seems to be about the same group of illegal immigrants. They're not talking about illegal immigrants from Ukraine or, Tim, or Timbuktu or, or, or New Zealand. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and they're very worried about uh, Islam, which is a big theme across the radical right, populist right, whatever we want to call it. Le Pen being a good example. Right. So getting back to Castilla y Leon, do you think nowadays, with, I, one thought I had watching the debate, I, I watched the debate, it, it, it wasn't a very interesting debate. I think the, the, the nobody won clearly. It was just sort of a series of mixed monologues that you could read on Twitter from the parties, basically. And, and the, the, the moderator was, was not asking any incisive questions at all to pressure the candidates. Do you think, do you, do you think many people watch these debates now and decide their vote from them or do we get our media from other places i suspect that the uh the, the debates don't don't change people's minds very much in normal elections <laughs> but you know it'd be probably good to check that with a political theorist but generally speaking you see the you see the polls before a debate and the polls afterwards and they don't seem to move the, the needle very much i think there might be exceptions to that obviously you're up in Barcelona, aren't you? Are people in Catalonia paying much attention to these elections? Uh, I haven't. I haven't been out very much because my kids have been uh, confined. <laughs> so, out of a sense of responsibility, I haven't been leaving the house very much. But uh, I certainly haven't uh, noticed much uh, people kind of talking about it. Uh, how would you how would you interpret them in a sort of a national key with what's going on with national politics at the minute in spain is it is the is the socialists stronger i mean we've been now we've now these are the first elections i think aren't they since since pablo iglesias mm -hmm. left office on the I left i think uh, matthew should we, should we just backtrack a bit and i'll give some background for anyone who's listening in who isn't hasn't really been following it is that okay? okay, so uh, I, I did some homework this this morning just to make sure that uh, <laughs> I had it all to hand. Uh, Castilla y Leon uh, was only formed as an autonomous community in 1983. Uh, its first two presidents were socialists, uh, and the next uh, five have been from the PP. Uh, the, the, the the current president since 2019 is a guy called Manueco. He's also the the candidate for the PP. There's an interesting backstory to this. Uh, there were elections in uh, there were elections in 2019, and the PP got its worst ever results. Uh, the Castilla-Leon has long been a stronghold of the PP. Athna, who was um, who was prime minister in the in the 90s for the PP, was a regional leader of of, of Castilla-Leon. But the socialists won the election without a without a majority, and the PP then did a deal with the which is a small liberal party. Uh, it's quite a strange decision because Ciudadanos was set up to be uh, to, to help the PP and the, and, and the socialists form governments without doing deals with nationalists. And they, they, they talk a lot about corruption and, and renewal. So it was quite strange, you know, with the PP having been in power for since eighty seven, for them to uh, for, for for them to do a deal with the PP rather than the socialists. There were lots of issues at, at the time that they were angry with the socialists, uh, but they took a bad call on it in in my opinion. And so Man, uh, they, they, they've been grumbling about about uh, corruption and Manueco, but while at the same time Theodoranos' support has been collapsing, people think they haven't done a very good job in 
stopping populists from coming to power. So my new office, It's funny you should Funny you should say that because the other night with during the debate, the only two relatively more intense moments, I mean, I mean, I say relatively, they weren't very intense, but they were a bit more intense than the rest of it, were what you just said about corruption, when the, the socialists and Ciudadanos uh, managed to get Manuel up against the ropes a little bit with corruption, and he, he found that more difficult to, to reply to. And then uh, also about the management of the COVID pandemic, because, of course, Ciudadanos and the PP in Castilla León shared that management over the last two years. And, and the, can the, the Ciudadanos candidate the other night during the debate was, in fact, at home having tested positive for COVID, sort of taking part virtually via Zoom. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think what was Manuel has seen an opportunity that because the Islamists are collapsing in the polls, he uh, he can uh, uh, he, he can stand a good chance of winning the elections, according to the opinion polls, at least. And I think there's something that we've spotted. We've seen it here. We've seen it in Madrid. It's happened in Portugal. It happened in the UK with the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives. And it's very difficult to be a junior partner in an alliance because when an election comes around, your voters might well switch to the senior party. People who might have been a bit reluctant to vote for the big party for whatever reason, corruption or scandals or whatever, they vote for a smaller party. That party then legitimizes them by doing a deal with them. And then you go, why vote for the copy when you can vote for the real thing? And I think that's a trend we've seen a lot, seen it very recently in Portugal where the socialists have just won and they've won a majority after having to govern with other populist left communist parties. Do you, do you think the PP is going to get a majority in these elections? Yeah, the polls suggest that it won't. Uh, the polls say it will get close. Uh, you need 41 seats for a majority and the polls say it will probably get 31 to 37. There's an outlier, which is the government's own poll, which said the socialists might win. That raised lots of eyebrows uh, because obviously it, <laughs> there's a... Nobody trusts yeah, that exactly. anymore. Although it does have quite a good track record. People always complain about it and then it surprises everyone by doing quite well. Uh, if, as you say, looking at the polls here, just as you were talking, I'm looking at the latest polls too for, for Castiglione on, and it, it, you're right, it's just it's, it's what the PP is on sort of somewhere between 35 and 40%. But if Ciudadanos is going away or going to few, even fewer seats this time, we'll have to see what happens on the 13th of February, of course. But if that's the case, then, uh, and, and the PP is not going to win a majority, it's going to need to try to govern with somebody or with the support of somebody. Um, do you think they would rather go with Vox? Will we see Vox in government for the first time in Spain in a regional government? Or will they do a sort of grand coalition with the social? I think there's a third option, actually, uh, Mackie, which I think is more likely. Uh, there are, There's a group of parties called España Vaciada, which in English is the, the empty Spain. Uh, lots of people in rural areas are very concerned about you know, lack of transport links and infrastructure and so forth. And uh, they've joined forces and uh, they could get one to six seats. Uh, there's a local party in Avila that could get zero to two seats and another one in Zamora that gets that could get one seat so you know the, 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 this kind of uh they're not even regionalists localists I suppose you could call them local uh, uh kind of um, interest groups uh and the, 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 there's a there's a strong scenario where they where the PP can do a deal with two or three of those and uh, th th that'd be quite easy deals to do. You know, you go to the guy in Zamora, what do you need? You know, we need a new hospital, then you need to add an extra lane to this motorway or whatever, you know. And they go, right, OK, we'll do that. It's the cost of the cost of power. So I think that's actually a, 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 an interesting an interesting model, not really applicable on a kind of national basis. Ciudadanos might get three seats in some of the polls. So, you know, you could throw them in the mix. And I think that the PP will probably be looking to do something like that rather than doing a deal with Vox. If they, if they get 30 seats... Do, do you think on a national level now, because of what's happened with, with this weekend with the far-right European meeting in Madrid, do you think that makes it more difficult now for Casado to go closer to doing deals like that with Vox? Because they, they've all sort of been dancing around this for a couple of years, haven't they? Not really wanting to get very close to it or admit that that's what they're thinking about doing together because the sort of the national ramifications would be pretty, pretty yeah. big. Um, but uh, especially when in other European countries we've seen uh, other conservative parties distance themselves from that, from that possibility. Um, but do you think it's more difficult now after this meeting in Madrid? 
I think it's always been difficult. I think Casado needs to define his strategy <laughs> and be very public about what it is. He basically has two options. And the better option, and he's been doing this, but he probably needs to do it a little bit more explicitly. Uh, liberal parties normally sit in the center of the of the uh, of the spectrum, maybe slightly center right, some of its supporters maybe slightly center left. But you know, there are more votes on the centre left than on the far right, or in the centre than on the, than on the far right in Spain. So, doing a kind of takeover of Ciudadanos, getting the positioning itself as a liberal party. Ayuso did this in in Madrid very well. She she's a liberal conservative, and she she managed to find rhetoric that appealed to liberal and centrist voters. I think that that would be a sensible strategy for for Casado. But if he does that, he re- he risks losing some of the more populist radical there we say far right votes uh, and on the other hand he can cozy up to vox and do deals and flutter his eyelids at them but then he risks you know some of the some of the liberals and centrists moving over to the left although Sanchez seems determined not to pick up those votes. He's doing things like uh, reforming the self-employed rules in a way that make a million people uh, very unhappy, <laughs> many of whom are probably the pro- liberal voters. Former, former, the former Spanish Prime Minister, Conservative Prime Minister, José María Aznar, said much the same thing, didn't he, during his speech? And it was interpreted by most people as being a sort of a, 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 a bit of a telling off for Casado, a bit of a, a nudge for Casado in much the same sense that you've just yeah. explained. And then he had to try and backtrack during a radio interview and, and, and sort of insist that he supported Casado and what Casado was doing at the minute. But it seems to be clear from the outside that that's what's going on. Athna is a very interesting politician, and I think he's much more interesting than people give him credit for. Uh, I was a correspondent for Dow Jones in the 90s and covered him. I had access to La Moncloa and covered uh, a few of his speeches. I covered Ratto much more, obviously, because it was economic, uh, because it was I was more covering economics. But I think what Athna did, did two things that were very clever and are underappreciated in Spain. One of them is he started out on the far right. He was involved in lots of kind of nationalist, Catholic organizations when he was a kid. But he gradually moved towards the centre and governed as a liberal conservative and almost as a liberal. And we can see that when he when he uh, the, the socialists had decided to get rid of national service and he didn't overrule that. He went for it. Obviously, liberals, libertarians in the American sense hate national service because they think people should be able to live their lives as they see fit. Whereas people on the on the right quite like it because they see people giving something back to the nation or whatever. And, you know, there, there's a kind of stereotype of Athena as being someone who's very far right. Whereas I think when push came to shove, he showed himself to be much more liberal. This is something people misunderstand in Spain all the time. They get it wrong about Ayuso too who is also a liberal conservative. And I think the other thing that Atma did that was that was clever and the PP hasn't managed to replicate in the last few years is that he just managed to unite everyone from the from the uh, from the right to the right of the socialists. So, uh, you know, and he... Yeah, I was going to say, I was just going to say that was going to be the very next question. Then we'll take some questions yeah. from everybody who's listening, perhaps. But... The, uh, there's, there's not much chance, is there, of Vox voters going back to the PP at this point? I would assume not. Uh, and people seem to be very, uh, what's the word, indignant, very self-righteous. When you meet Vox supporters, they're like, I vote for Vox and you're not changing my mind, you, 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 know, you university-educated metropolitan person. <laughs> Unless they changed out Casado for a youth. Yeah. Ah, that would be the clever move. That, that, that would be the clever move. <laughs> I, I wrote a blog the, the other day about the two games of politics. Yeah, One game is winning elections and the other game is governing. And normally they're different skill sets. And what makes a youth so difficult and dangerous to the left is that she knows how to win elections and she knows how to govern in a way that yields good results for voters. And that's a really unusual combination in Spain. And the left try and attack her as a fascist, which she isn't, and it just backfired very, very badly in the, in the Madrid elections. Casado, he's obviously never been in government, he's never won elections, <laughs> so he's uh, got uh, unproven at uh, both uh, 
both of those. I would say that Sanchez is actually a failure at winning elections and a failure at governing as well. Although he's very good, he's got a plan B. He's very good at forming coalitions. Cool. Let's take some questions or comments from people who are listening and give everybody a few seconds to raise their hands on Twitter if they want to ask a question of uh, uh, Rupert or, or make some comment. If you would like to ask Rupert Koch any questions about Spain or politics from Barcelona, now is your chance. And if not, then we have finished for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. It's been a pleasure, as always. And... uh, and good luck with the Fox supporters on Twitter driving you crazy. <laughs> yeah, we, I, we, we, we'll keep going. We're not, they're not going to win. Um, we, we will keep being independent and doing independent journalism. Thank you, Rupert, from Barcelona. Thank you, everybody, for listening and for supporting this independent journalism. See you next okay, time. Okay, thank you. Bye.